This video is going to be a little longer than what I usually publish. In the interest of being comprehensive, however, it is important not to gloss over facts. Unfortunately, when it comes to evolution, that is what people usually tend to do, and it has led to a great many very stubborn misconceptions. Evolution is a word describing a process in biology by which speciation occurs, but the word itself is older than Darwin or any of the ideas he proposed. Evolution is a word that describes gradual development, refinement through iteration. Let's use bicycles as an example. The bikes we have today are very different from the penny farthings of yesteryear. But once you start to consider the development of the various technologies that made modern bicycles possible, it is not hard to see how we went from the unwieldy, dangerous penny farthings to the unwieldy, dangerous modern bike. The huge front wheel of the penny farthing was necessary due to a lack of suspension, chain-driven gears and pneumatic tires. The large circumference of the driven wheel allowed both for higher speed since it was driven directly by the pedals and also offered limited shock absorption, but necessitated a fair bit of skill and sound judgment in order to operate the vehicle safely. With the advent of pneumatic tires and chain drive, the Rover, marketed as the safety bicycle, made the penny farthing obsolete. Since then, many more developments have led to gradual improvements over the original rover design to the point where we have today many different kinds of bicycles, some designed for very niche requirements. Which is not to say that what we have today are the final bicycles. What we see now is simply a transient state in the evolution of bicycles. They will continue to go through this process of gradual development forever. Two-wheeled vehicles with a saddle, handlebars and pedals that translate muscle power into forward motion will exist and will always be recognized as bicycles for as long as humans have any sort of interest in pedal power. Where evolution in biology is a result of gene transmission modulated by natural selection, bicycles as we know them today are the result of market forces steering their development. In each case, success is defined through interaction with the environment over successive generations. And it is by refinement through iteration that gradual change is made manifest. How much iteration? Infinite. Now, of course, no matter how much iterative development we put a living organism through, its evolution can only follow a pattern of gradual change where consumer products can and often do make great leaps, even revolutionary advancements in development, from one generation to another. Natural selection can send bad designs back to the drawing board, and can only result in their death. For all the praise we lay at the feet of natural selection, it is a dreadfully inefficient process. But if there is no continued iteration, Evolution does not occur. Lobsters can live, it's theorized, forever. But what is the point of living for 2000 years if your genes aren't passed on? From an evolutionary perspective, none. Evolution selects for more than individual survival. Survival of the fittest is a phrase that, while broadly speaking correct, will likely mislead you into thinking survival is a necessary element of evolutionary success. It isn't. Reproductive success is the main driving force behind evolution, not so much the ability of any one individual replicator to survive. The plumage of a peacock, for example, is of no usefulness to the bird's ability to survive, but it is of great utility when attracting a mate. Peafowl, birds of paradise, mandarin ducks, and many other organisms exhibit striking features that are the result of sexual selection, not to mention flowers. All these organisms exhibit traits that come at great cost to the individual, 
for no other reason than they secure reproductive success. And what is being communicated exactly by this dance? Athletic fitness? Rhythmic ability? Fashion sense? No. Cost is the signal. But having lots of offspring is not in and of itself a measure of reproductive success. Suppose you're a religious leader and you convince impressionable women of questionable age to join your cult and bear you many children. On the face of it, it may seem like your skill in exploiting the game mechanics is securing yourself an evolutionary high score. But if your pedophilic predilections draw the attention of government who decide to put the boot to your neck and burn your house down along with everyone in it, then at the end of the day you will have achieved the same reproductive success as the bum who dies in a homeless shelter from a heroin overdose. Evolution requires only continued iteration. It could very well be argued that all extant species in the world today have achieved equal evolutionary success because they are all examples of continued iteration. The successful reproductive strategy developed in mosquitoes is to lay as many eggs as possible, investing zero effort in the success of individual offspring. The successful reproductive strategy developed in humans involves great investment in the individual success of relatively few young, and our ability to do so is heavily influenced, in turn, by our own upbringing. For a mosquito to lay a single egg in a nest and then guard it tirelessly would be patently maladaptive. The advantages conferred by any one adaptation are rarely decisive for survival on its own, but rather balanced against other synergistic and antagonistic adaptations, which consequently cannot change without affecting others. The common charge against evolution, that it teaches us the optimal strategy is to have as many children as possible, and thus can't have anything to say on morality, is based on a child's conception of the facts at hand. While true that such a strategy is heavily incentivized in some environments by EBT cards, free school meal vouchers, and subsidized housing coupled with poor impulse control in the population. Broadly speaking, the effects of being raised by a single mother are purely negative for humans. For some species, the favored evolutionary strategy is to have lots of offspring. For others, it is to have fewer young that are given more care. From a strictly evolutionary point of view, neither strategy is more or less valid than the other. But it goes further than this, and this leads into my next point. If an organism dies without leaving offspring, its genetic material is gone from the population. Not necessarily. Not all traits we carry in our genes are expressed. It is only through iteration that the totality can be revealed. I'm not blonde, but my son is, revealing my hair color to be heterozygous. My wife did not select me though because she knew I carried a recessive allele that matched her hair color. It is only when expressed that natural selection can act on a trait. As a human, you are at the most fundamental level nothing more than a set of genes being expressed in an environment. But at any one point, you won't be expressing the entire set coded in the 3 billion base pairs of your DNA. If you're a man, for example, you will not have a set of tits. You won't have a uterus nor fallopian tubes. Your body won't experience a menstrual cycle and you won't have a pair of X chromosomes. Nonetheless, your DNA carries the code to all these things. So in this video by Hank Green that I quote, What's to say all those flowers aren't related? All the other flowers will at least have some of their genetic material in common with the one that died without having reproduced. Without knowing that the yellow flower failed to reproduce as a result of a maladaptive trait unique to that individual, 
it could just as well be the case that its inability to reproduce in some way aided the success of the other flowers. Based on the information we have, we can't say. What if that yellow flower was your gay uncle? What if it was your wine aunt? The one that smells of cigarettes and cat piss? Your wine aunt may be a genetic dead end herself, but you're not. And you've got a whole lot of the same genes that she does. And what do I know? Maybe your wine aunt is a real cool person who gets your foot in the door at her law firm downtown. Maybe she gifts you tickets to Coachella and secures you backstage access where you meet your future spouse who marries you for your money. Could it really be said then that your wine aunt was without evolutionary utility? No. And through you, a portion of her genetic material, the portion she has in common with your parent, will live on to be tested by the environment in another generation. The simple fact that we don't express all the qualities coded in our genes is also responsible for the occurrence of geniuses born to simpletons or complete retards sired by doctors and engineers. That the sudden emergence of traits expressing themselves in extraordinary ways has a tendency to, over generations, return to the genetic baseline of a population is known as the regression to the mean. Group selection is a term that attempts to explain selective pressures that lead to the development of traits that, while not necessarily beneficial to any one individual, are beneficial to the population as a whole. The basic idea being that a group of cooperative individuals will be able to outcompete less cooperative loners. The only sound criticism of group selection is that it does not explain any observable evolutionary process that is not already sufficiently explained by gene selection alone. I myself will make no determination on this, but it's a useful phrase for casual conversation, like this one. So what might be an example of group selection and the kinds of behavior it can produce in a species? There is, of course, the classic example that Jordan Peterson always likes to reference of the tyrannical chimpanzee who, even though he may be the strongest and toughest son of a bitch around, should he treat the members of his troop too harshly, runs the risk of being torn apart by two smaller, weaker chimps who work in unison to murder him and usurp his rule. But that's already been done to death. Let's consider elephants. While direct observations are rare, elephants are known to make detours covering great distances for the sole purpose of visiting the bones of their dead relatives. They will investigate the carcass, stroke and smell the bones, sometimes even carry bones with them for several miles. These acts of mourning are of no evolutionary utility neither for the individual nor the herd they belong to. These activities are purely detrimental to the group and its members. It has them wasting time and energy on frivolous distractions. Yet they are compelled to do it. Why? Because these acts, which have come to be associated with grief and a fascination for their dead kin, are an expression of an underlying trait that has evolutionary utility. That trait is altruism, social conscience, and elephants have it in spades. The point is, we can't say with confidence that every behavior we're able to identify has any evolutionary utility, but it must be an expression of a trait that does. That's not to say some behavior can't be purely maladaptive. The true crime genre exists as a testament to the endless examples of maladaptive traits expressing themselves and being selected against. But how can we determine the fitness, the evolutionary value of any single trait when the realm of possibility defined by our physical reality 
allows for innumerable variety to emerge in any given generation. What's to say something we disapprove of might not hold great value? The most pervasive misconception of evolution is this, that it doesn't have anything to say about the particular value of any one trait, that it can only inform us of the process by which that trait came to be, that evolution tells us nothing of what we should do, only how it is we arrived at our current form. This is false. As I've laid out previously in my video on the highest moral good, through an understanding of evolution, we can arrive at normative statements. That the possible variation we may encounter is endless does not preclude us from being able to identify patterns of success. That our brains have evolved to be able to process such incredible computational complexity is for this very purpose. It is a pattern recognition machine that exists primarily to help us recognize patterns of success. This is not by chance. To say that it is, and to say that we can't make value judgments based on any one interpretation, because of variation in the world is caused by serendipity, is to fall victim to the same irrational superstition that has resulted in the intellectually bankrupt ideology of the postmodernist movement. Now you could of course make that argument, and no doubt you will find many who agree with you. But in whose company will you be? You will have attempted the exact same criticism of evolution as Kent Hovind. Now if you want to go hang in the same corner as the young earth creationists, that's all well and good. But I'm going to go ahead and recognize it for the pattern of failure that it is.